Hi everybody, I'm Bill Sanders and this is Watch Art Sci, the art and science of watch collection. Uh, today was uh, such a nice spring day. We've had rain and rain and more rain, so I thought, well, I would try to have it outside today and um, at least to get started. And what I want to start with today is the watch of the week. And uh, the watch we have is Ross Gallon's Blanc Pain. I better get the name of it right. It's called a Quantum A Complete. And uh, it is really a complete watch. Uh, it has, among other things, it has the day of the week, like Monday, Tuesday, and so forth. It has the month, January, February. And the thing that I like about it, it's got the day of the month around the dial. And it's got like, it looks like a little shepherd's crook. Uh, to that goes under each one of the uh, each one of the uh, uh, different numbers for the day of the week or the day of the month and let's see and of course it's got a moon phase so uh, this is a very very cool watch and Blanc Payne is getting more and more interesting of uh, about a month or so ago I was at uh, the uh, Harry um, Winston uh, boutique in New York City and I was talking to the guy about the future of Harry Winston. He said, well, you know, he said, from now on, there are going to be Blanc Pain movements in it. And the interesting thing about that is that the Blanc Pain movements are pretty much Frederick Piguet. Now, I say that as a good thing because I have a lot of respect for Frederick Piguet. In fact, uh, I wore my uh, Vesteron Constantine 1972. And it has a Frederick Piguet based 6.10 movement in it. So uh, that's sort of a cool thing. And I'm not really sure, to tell you the truth, the extent to which the bases for all Blanc Pains are Frederick Piguet. Uh, but they may be or they may not be. Uh, it's sort of an interesting thing to find out. But I know that they're, they have a really good. Uh, movement in them and this one is pretty complex so anyway um, let me thank Ross very much for letting us use his watch for the watch of the week and uh, I, I looked around and they are available um, you can find watches like this and they're they're <laughs> they're a sort of a high horology watch and uh, in fact they're very much so a high horology watch so you can Maybe they might cost uh, a few more than, see, I have to skip a few meals. <laughs> okay. All right. So now uh, let's take a look at a very, very interesting watch that most of, most of us have heard of, but we really don't know too much about, and that is the Beauvais. Well, hi again. We're back inside. Um, let's talk about a watch company that a lot of people have heard of but they really don't know much about and um, it's, there's a lot to it so let's get started. Now Beauvais has got to be understood in, in three periods really. Uh, the first period I call the China trade and it was between roughly 1822 and 1864. The second uh, phase I refer to as the diaspora. The reason for that is that diaspora means that people are scattered all over the place, and they had. Uh, this is certainly the case with Beauvais. There was a period from about 1864 to 2001 when it was a lot of different things at different times. Okay, so uh, and then in 2001. Uh, the period I'd like to refer to as a renaissance, and it, and it was a true renaissance in in the best of every way imaginable. <laughs> so, um, so let's get started in taking a look at this really incredible watch company. Okay, uh, during the uh, the China phase, now, now get this, let, let's say you, you have a startup and you take four watches and you're going to try to sell them in China. All right, so you go to Canton and you sell all four of them immediately for a million dollars. All right, now, this is like, whoa. whoa. Um, now, at the time, Beauvais was, was operating out of uh, London, 
uh, for a lot of different reasons. That was sort of the uh, center of during the early um, 19th century, 1822, when he first got started. And also, too, for heading for China, the, uh, the China trade, the East India Tea Company, and so forth. Anyway, so the early watches they had, they were these beautiful decorations. They had, uh, they had gems and pearls and engravings and miniature uh, paintings in something called Grand Fu enamel. And this was very popular with the Chinese. Uh, another interesting thing were t uh, twin watches. Uh, there was a, uh, among the Chinese at that time, it was considered good luck. Twins were good luck. And also, too, is that while one was being repaired, you could have the other one. And so uh, twin watches were another thing uh, that uh, Beauvais uh, took. Now, uh, the reason it, it didn't go beyond too long was the Opium Wars. And the, the Opium Wars were probably, I think, <laughs> the reason that uh, British colonials are, <laughs> their period are too, too, too popular. The British were making a fortune selling tea, silk, and porcelains uh, back in England. I mean, you ship that back there and the tea was, everyone was buying tea, they, they couldn't get enough of it. But the Chinese said, a look at what the English had to offer, and there's, eh, there's not a lot there. Now, the interesting thing about that was the one thing that they did like were the watches. And the watches, like I said, were, were out of England at the time, but for some reason, I guess you, <laughs> you could only have so many watches. Also, too, the watches were generally sold uh, to Chinese royalty, the emperor and his court and so forth. So, um, and so the Chinese said, well, there's just stuff we're not too interested in. So if you want this, uh, you have to pay us in silver. Okay, so the British got the idea. What they would do is that they, they started growing opium fields in India. And India at the time was under British rule. And they would sell the opium to the Chinese for silver and then take the silver and pay for the tea and the silk and the porcelain. And after a certain point, the Chinese said, you know, oh, this is not good for our people. This, you know, you got a bunch of, of people on the hip, you know, and these uh, opium dens. So uh, they burned up all of the opium that, the, that this, one, this one supply of opium, there's a lot of it. They burned it up on the wharf. So uh, the British got all upset and attacked them, and there was a there was called the first um, I think it was called the first Opium War, and the Chinese had to pay for all of the opium that got burned up. But you know this is not this didn't good. Now this was during the Qing Dynasty, and uh, you know this was they were trying to hold things together, and they there were a number of trade restrictions and a number of advantages that were given to the British and other uh, Western uh, countries, including France and Germany, I think, and even the United States to some extent. And so then there was another war, another, it was a great, it was much bigger than the first one. Uh, but the, um, uh, the British uh, finally won that. Well, uh, in the process, they killed the watch trade. And so by the end of the war in 1864, uh, it was pretty well shot, and so that was the end of phase one of uh, Beauvais watches. Okay, now the, the second stage is at the same time very interesting and very hard to figure out. I call it the uh, diaspora because it, it went everywhere. Uh, one of the few watches uh, from that period is, this is my Beauvais, this is a, um, a mono um chronograph. And uh, it, it's really more of a Valju 84 that's cased in Beauvais. There's, I, I, I do, I love this watch, but it's not 
Beauvais either in the terms of the beautiful decorations that they had uh, initially or the modern ones where they have the innovation except for one thing. And one of the very important things about this watch is that in a very complex way, okay, uh, one of the patents does have uh, Beauvais, I think it was Charles Jean Renard Beau, uh, Beauvais, uh, that has the patent on the mono uh, pont. Uh, and and that is that is about the stage of it. Well, you try to find a watch from the old, old times, and um, they're pretty expensive. There was one, there was a, a Christie's had an auction, and I think there were some Patet Philippe's that were for sale, and they were very rare ones and good ones. And uh, they sold for something millions of dollars. And so then they had this uh, this little bunch of Beauvais that were available. They sold for over $2 million. So Beauvais, is got, if you got the old ones um, from, the, from the early China trade, those are extremely valuable. Uh, the ones from the diaspora, it's not so much that they're valuable, there just aren't any of them. There aren't that many. And and uh, I got the, mine uh, simply by, by, by dumb luck more than anything else. Okay, this is the end of part one. And uh, what we'll do is that we'll just, we'll come back with uh, part two. But it was pretty, getting pretty long, so I said to break it into two parts. But you have them both. It'll be part one or part two. Okay, uh, see you then.